and I think it was very beneficial for a lot of the people. So some of the topics that we plan on discussing in this Sofa Talk, inshallah, are topics that relate with every single one of you. I know that many people, for example, would like to get married. That's a topic, inshallah, we will be touching up on. The topic for today's discussion was the remembrance of Allah. And all of these things, we will notice, lead back to the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my first question, Mufti, would be, you spoke in your talk, mashallah, about spiritual upliftment, about remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in different situations. I wanted to ask you that many a time, us as Muslims, we all know the purpose of life. We all know that we need to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know this is our purpose of life. But many a times in our lives, our, our, our life is filled with work, with gym, with studies. And the time that we purely and solely dedicate for Allah is very less in our days. Is there a way that we can make all of these things that we do for the sake of Allah? Definitely there is a way to make everything that we do in our daily lives for the sake of Allah. It's one word, intention. When your intention changes and becomes correct, it's rectified, then you can earn reward even while you're eating, even while you're sleeping. Uh, you know, even when you go to the gym, even when you're, for example, driving, whatever it is, where are you going and why are you going? So when I'm eating... It's not easy initially, especially when you're enjoying some dessert from one of the classic dessert places here, to think I'm doing this for the sake of Allah, you know, because I'm enjoying a big cake. And by the way, people are becoming more health conscious now. So those of you who have dessert places, you might want to consider. I'm sure you already are considering the health, health factor, you know. But um, with me, I have a password. I'll eat it and I'll just say, I need to cut down. That's the password. The need to cut down does not mean I've cut down. It just means I need to cut down. Yes, I do. But I'll munch this right now. But let's go back to what you were saying. You, you say, look, Allah has allowed you to eat. Allah has allowed you to drink. In fact, you have to eat and drink. But what you need to know... Sorry, we're going to need to change the battery here, Sheikh, soon. What you need to know is, you say, oh Allah, I thank you for what you've bestowed upon me. I will... Salam. So, so we're, uh, we're saying that, you know what, I, I, I'm going to eat this and I'd like to ensure that, number one, I'm not doing haram. You know, when you're eating, no matter what you're eating, the fact that you're eating halal and you're conscious of it is a great act of worship. It's an ibadah. Many of us don't think of it. So when I put something in my mouth, I'm eating. The first thing I should know with my bismillah is that this thing is halal. Yesterday I was in a town known as Bolton. Some of you, most of you will know it obviously, right? And there was a brother across the road from the masjid. He had a little cafe. And when I went in there, I told him, brother, the fact that you are providing halal food to people is already an act of worship. The fact that you're providing halal because you are worried about what you're buying. You're buying halal because you want to provide halal. That's an act of worship on its own. But many of us haven't even thought of that yet. We say, right, I'll open a cafe, I'll make some money and inshallah we'll earn. Okay, but you don't realize I'm making it easy for people to eat halal. They have to eat anyway. The same applies to your dessert, your ice cream. People might say it's indulging. Indul okay, but it's halal, isn't it? I was conscious of Allah. That's what made me eat the halal. So do you see how I'm getting a reward because I'm eating? I'm eating halal. The same applies when you're, for example, going to the gym. Yes, you must try and look for an environment that is uh, decent. You can't say, okay, I'm, I'm going, you know, th there's a male going to an all-female's gym, you know. And then he's saying, but you know, Allah says you must keep your body fit, you know, you must this. You hang on, hang on, hang on. You need to rectify one or two basics and then you say, yes, indeed, I need to look after my health. Many of us, you know, I I'm going to let you in on something personal. Two days ago, my son, who's about 11, one of my sons, about 11, he looks at his mom and he says, dad's belly is starting to pop out. And wallahi, I overheard this. I won't lie to you. And I looked at him and I said, what? You really want to see your belly? 
I can show you a few guys with bellies. But deep down, I thought to myself, I went back and started looking. Hey, is this guy right? You know, I've got to do something. But then again, it's all British food, you know, mashallah. May Allah make it easy for us. But the bottom line is yes, indeed, to look after yourself, your shape, to make sure you exercise is good not only for your mind, but for your spirituality as well. When you feel good, you, you enjoy your salah because you feel good, you look good. You look good for who? For myself, because I want to feel good. I want to be a person who appreciates this body that Allah has given me. So instead of me doing it in order to show off with it, which is actually wrong, I've just cleared my intention to say, I'm going to do this so that I feel good because it has been proven that if you spend about 45 minutes to an hour every day with some form of exercise by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will feel much better psychologically. You feel better. And if you're feeling better, you're going to be a happier person. You're going to make the people around you not feel miserable because when you're miserable, you want everyone else subconsciously to be miserable. So in that way, you can actually convert everything you're doing into the remembrance of Allah. You know, I took, okay, I was in Cape Town and a brother had a Lamborghini that he, he gave me, he told me, it was a very nice one, but this is about two, three years old, the story. He says, brother, you, you can drive this thing. I said, okay, now there is a way of driving it and basically I've done it so I know, right? I told him, is it okay if I rip it? He says, rip it. I said, you told that to the wrong man. Okay. So basically, we kicked off. And then I told myself, hang on, I need to correct my intention. I'm just appreciating the gifts of Allah. I'm just trying to check. I'm just trying to see what Allah's given us as humankind such advancement that we have a little contraption of this nature. And I'm going to be testing its guts in order to praise Allah for what he's given. Although it's not me, but to humankind. He tells me, you're stretching it a bit. Meaning, you're trying to convert this into a good deed. Anyway, and we were out and the sound was wow. We, we, we came into Cape Town Airport with such a big noise, such a big noise. And I enjoyed the, you know, dropping the gear as we just entered and everyone just turned around and <clears throat> he tells me, I don't think that was an act of worship at all. Subhanallah. But may Allah forgive us. May Allah forgive us. At least I tried, right? And I'm not trying to justify it, but all I'm doing is showing you that we should try, try. And Allah will open the doors. But the strange thing, Brother Musa, is when we don't remember Allah at all, a day passes, two days pass, three days pass, and we haven't even thought of Allah. We haven't spent a moment with Allah, but we've spent hours on end at work and doing so and so, whatever else we're doing without remembering Allah. That's what's scary. I think every one of us today, this reminder should make us from those who put back Allah into the equation. Put him back. Even if it's you're driving, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, mashallah, tabarakallah, la ilaha illallah, subhanallah, bihamdi, subhanallah, al-azim. That's a powerful remembrance of Allah. And that's the topic today. Powerful remembrance of Allah. Say these words. Learn their meanings because they will, they will be more powerful when you know the meaning of what you're saying. People ask me, you know, I'm feeling sad. What should I read? I say, read Surah Al-Duha, but don't read it without reading its meaning as well. If you read Surah Al-Duha, Wal-Duha, Wal-Layli, Ida, Saja, many of us know exactly what that Surah is, but we don't know its meaning. If you say, Wal-Duha, they'll say, Wal-Layli, Ida, Saja, straight away. Even the kids. Do you know what that means? Your Lord has not forsaken you, nor is he upset with you. Nor is he angered with you. Many of us feel Allah is upset with us. Perhaps he's angry with us. Perhaps we've done something. If whatever has happened has drawn you slightly closer to Allah, it's not the anger of Allah. It's the pleasure of Allah. It's the gift of Allah upon you. So inshallah, we can increase that remembrance of Allah upon all conditions and everything we do. Don't let anyone discourage you. You know, some people also say that, you know, I feel so discouraged because I feel like I'm very far from the mercy of Allah. And when I sit and talk to them, a lot of the times it's someone who's outwardly more pious having said something that makes them very, very negative. You know, if I'm already in hell, what's the point of doing any goodness? Who says you're already in hell? The people who said that, they've got to be there to have seen who's in hell. Do you get that? If someone says you're in hell, 
Well, that means they, they're there already watching who's there and who's not, you know? It's like a guy says, I saw you in the nightclub. Well, how did you see me? You were there, right? Exactly. So how did you see these guys in hell? So stop saying that. Stop discouraging people. Inshallah, we, we all would like the, the pleasure of Allah. May Allah make it easy for us. Barakallah. I mean, I mean. So, okay. Bismillah. We're going to share today, Mufti, inshallah. <laughs> so, um, one of the things that actually um, caught my attention during your speech was um, you mentioned something that when uh, the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for his slave, he afflicts him with trials. Many people, I'm sure you get messages on a daily basis. I get these messages of people in, 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 in problem people going through different things, depression, anxiety, maybe mental health, maybe physical health, maybe they feel very, very far from Allah. Maybe, for example, I got a me message once from a sister, she said she's in a very far place and she cries and she, she, she wants to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but because of her past, she finds it very difficult. A lot of people, because they have made their environments for themselves, they're not in good environments, they find it so difficult to become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are being afflicted with trials on a daily basis. What advice could we give to these people? Because we know that the prophets, may peace and blessing be upon all of them, were the most afflicted people. How can we put that into our minds and actually not only put it into our minds but put it into practice the way they did? I think it's extremely important for us to make mention of the term hope, hope. Hope is a gift of Allah, such a great gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we need to speak about it constantly and we need to instill hope within others by speaking to them, by... Can I try this? Okay. MashaAllah. I'm hopeful, brother, don't worry. Okay, the registration plate is here, PL17YHJ. I can't believe, brother, you haven't got a few guys to just carry the car. Deal with it the African way, bro. PL17. That means please. Oh, that means please 17 times. So PL17. We can repeat it if you need. YHJ. And this is going to be all over the world. So your car has just increased in value. <laughs> Mashallah. Imagine people are going to say, that's the car. Wow. It was spoken about. May Allah bless you and give you good use of your car. Please can you get up, brother or sister? And it's a blue vehicle. It looks like a... What's the make of the car? Vogzo, mashallah. And there, there goes, mashallah. Parked exactly halfway on the pavement and on the road. Alhamdulillah. I can see it. Alhamdulillah. Allah bless you. Tell me when the guy comes back. One, two, one, we'll make two. another dua for him. Don't worry. We're hopeful that he will get up or she will get up and go. It's not bad. You know, to make a mistake is very human when you don't rectify it then it says more about you than the mistake did may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us oh that looks like you're going to beat me up <laughs> okay so we're getting back to what brother Musa was asking before the little distraction and that is many people want to turn to Allah they know that they're in a bad place or far away but I promise you, my brothers, you have to build the hope. You have to know that the most merciful is Allah. Without understanding the mercy of Allah, you're not going to be able to help yourself. Do you know that when you don't have water, Allah tells you you can do tayammum. Tayammum means I'm just, I'm not going to clean myself with water because I don't have it or I cannot use it. So Allah's basically telling you, I don't need you to use the water if there's a reason why you don't or you, you cannot use it. So Allah's telling you, you can still pray and you don't even have that wudu according to the proper way that it's supposed to be. Doesn't that show you the mercy of Allah? I had someone who had severe OCD and I told them, Allah 
is not really going to punish you if you've made a mistake or two in your wudu with this condition that you're in right now. And they were like, no way. I have to. There's wudu. It takes me eight hours to make wudu. What? What did you just say? How many hours? You set yourself three minutes. Whatever you've done in the interim, you've done it. And Allah will forgive you. What? Now, obviously, this is an extreme case, but we were starting, we were trying to start, you know, to help them out of it. And then I said, look, Allah doesn't even punish those who don't make wudu if there's a reason why they cannot do it. And I was referring here to tayammum. But they were like, I don't think that's right. I said, I know what I'm talking about. So going back to what I'm saying, if, you're, if you don't understand the mercy of Allah, you're never going to come out of your mess. Allah loves you and Allah will continue loving you and Allah made you and Allah knows about you and He knows your struggles. He knows where you've been and He knows where you want to be. And He knows that you might be moving very slowly and He also knows that your graph might dip now and again on its way up. But let's not become like cryptocurrency. You know, it, kept, it, it went up, it gave everybody hope and suddenly it started coming down, you know. And now it's just looking so gloomy. Am I right? I didn't hear so many yeses because the guy's already so gloomy. But inshallah, we, we need to have the hope in the mercy of Allah. That's number one. Number two is, there are two ways of changing. Either you do it instantly by shifting your, your area, your location, your house, your suburb. Go into a place perhaps where there are better people. Perhaps a whole new area, a whole new town. You start afresh with new company, new everyone. You start choosing them properly. That has helped a lot of people as well. Especially those who have bad habits. It's helped them a lot. We're going to need to change this as well, brother. Don't worry, I won't get cross. This is, this is, uh, mashallah, it's... Perhaps it's the base. If the base is a little bit too far, you know, brother Musa is, oh, it's right there. Then there's a problem with the battery. Mashallah. Third time, inshallah. Testing. Testing again. Brother, the other one was better than this one. <laughs> Whoa, third time, lucky. Definitely, this thing looks like it's legit, you know, mashallah. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, this happens in marriage as well. If you have, things are broken down, communications broken down once, it's okay. Alhamdulillah. If you happen to go through a divorce, you're not a bad person. I know of a lot of brothers and sisters who are divorced and they are way better than some of those who haven't yet been married. I want to repeat that. I know of brothers and sisters who are divorced and they are way better. Uh oh, someone didn't like that. They're way better than those who are sometimes not yet married. And sometimes they try again and they're divorced again and they try a third time and guess what? They get something legit, alhamdulillah. And then they can hold it carefully and say, you're mine, mashallah. May Allah bless you. May Allah grant you ease. Brother, let's go back to what we were saying. What was it? It was about coming out of the, the deep end. Okay, so let me explain. I remember. I wanted to say something. So, we spoke about the mercy of Allah. We spoke about change of environment, right? Sometimes that's not possible. So what you do? Step by step, start changing things. Bit by bit and don't give up. The day you give up, that's the day that you've lost. Allah never gives up. Never. For Allah, no matter how bad you've been, no matter where you have gone, it's a flick. You need to ask Allah's forgiveness. He's wiped out all the bad, all of it, completely gone. And if you make an error and go back and slip again, come back and seek the forgiveness of Allah again, never give up. So either you correct yourself overnight and you've changed or you build brick by brick. You build such that inshallah you will come out and it, you will be in a better place by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So inshallah we, we won't lose hope in the mercy of Allah. Now we're going to share this particular microphone inshallah. That too is the mercy of Allah. Barakallah It's definitely legit. So um, one, one, of the, one of the things that actually came into my mind Mufti while you were talking was about Many of the things that you're mentioning pertain and relate to a good thought of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's, a, there's actually a hadith that I came across the other day about a man 
that was doomed and he was destined for Jahannam and something happened to him. Could you tell us a little bit about that? So the hadith where the, the man's basically, he's, he's lived a life and he, he's done wrong and he's being dragged to Jahannam. And as he's being dragged to Jahannam, he looks up at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah asks him, what did you think of me? What did you think of this situation? What did you think I would do? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, and the man responds to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and says, oh Allah, I thought you would forgive me. I thought you would forgive me. So just because that man had good thought of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah forgave him. And from him going to Jahannam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put him into Jannah. The hadith says, Ana inda dhanni abdi bi. The Prophet ﷺ tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I will treat each one of my slaves as he or she perceives me. So how you think Allah is going to treat you, that's how you're going to be treated because if you think that Allah won't forgive, that is an insult to Allah. It's an insult to Allah. How do you expect to be treated then? When you believe that he was not the most forgiving, most merciful. But when you believe Allah is forgiving, Allah is merciful and you keep trying. Remember, when, when you want the mercy of Allah, one thing that is required of you is the trial. You need to try. Even if you falter and dilly dally, you need to try. And you need to keep trying. You cannot say, I'm going to commit all the sins on earth and you know, I firmly believe Allah is going to forgive me. Because that again is playing into the hands of the devil. That's what shaitan wants you to do, to have a false hope. But the Prophet Muhammad says, whoever wants to enter Jannah will enter. In fact, in one narration, he says, all of you will enter paradise, except he or she who refuse or refuses. The reason is, when the Sahaba radiallahu anhum asked him, well, who would refuse? He says, whoever follows me will enter Jannah. And whoever refused, whoever doesn't has refused. Whoever doesn't has refused. And what is the following of Allah and His Rasul? You will obey the obligations, you will stay away from the prohibitions, and you will seek forgiveness for the mistakes you've made. As simple as that. So when we seek the forgiveness of Allah and we have firm conviction that Allah is Ghafoor, Rahim, when Allah says Ghaffar, you know the meaning of the term Ghaffar is so amazing that if you were to ponder over it, it would rejuvenate your Iman. Ghaffar actually means the one who constantly forgives again and again and again. Because Ghafoor is one who forgives often. And Ghaffar is the one who forgives so much. Subhanallah, every time you sin, He forgives you. Every time you falter, He forgives you. Every time you make a mistake, He forgives you. So I want to tell you something today. If you have made a mistake or committed a sin, the first step is to believe that Allah is most forgiving. You believe that Allah is most forgiving. And you believe that Allah is purifying you. The moment you seek forgiveness. One of the plots of shaitan is to make you think that your tawbah is rejected. Your repentance is rejected. That's a plan of the devil. He makes you lose hope in the mercy of Allah when Allah tells you, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Tell my worshippers who have transgressed against themselves that indeed Never lose hope in the mercy of Allah for He is most forgiving, most merciful. He will forgive all your sins. That's a verse of the Quran. It's called the verse of hope. Allah says He will forgive all your sins. So when you lose hope, you've played straight into the hands of the devil who promises you, Allah won't forgive you. So stop thinking that Allah won't forgive you. Allah will. He will forgive you. He loves you. He cares for you. But don't give up. Keep on trying and keep trying and try to make today better than yesterday and tomorrow better than today. If that happens in your relationship with Allah, you're heading in the right direction. Even if you're a tortoise, even if you're so slow, 
it's okay you're still heading towards jannah the hadith says when a person intends to do a good deed they are already rewarded with the intention then when they do it it's multiplied 10 10 fold and more than that perhaps so the minute i have intended to go for salatul fajr for example if an obstacle comes in my path and i didn't manage do you know what i was already rewarded via my intention so if i've intended to get to jannah to get to the pleasure of allah and i'm trying and i'm on the path and i die in that condition do you know what's going to happen i'm convinced that allah will take me to paradise convinced and i invite you to enjoy that conviction because definitely allah is most merciful jazakallah khairan mufti now moving on to a different topic actually but still pertaining to the remembrance of allah of course in many islamic events what we're trying to do is remember allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shaykh will come a sheikh will come he'll give a talk and you know it's all good mashallah but but why are some people charging for these events for why are people charging to spread knowledge why are people charging for events you know i think i think there might be someone here who had who had that question well, it's between me and someone. okay some friendly banter mashallah so why, why is this going on? Why, why are people charging? Are shiyukh taking advantage of the Muslims? Okay, putting me in a spot, mashallah. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, you see, obviously, there is an expense to do a lot of things. And many times, people cover it. You have a sponsor who donates. I remember in Nigeria, there was an event that they had to, they had to, they wanted to do for the ummah and who for the young the boys and the girls those who don't normally you know attend and you know religious functions and for, for the ummah even people who do attend everyone is allowed to come and they wanted to have it at a good venue they wanted to you know do proper uh, arrangements make everything up to standard because people look at islam and they think well it's such a backward religion you know you just got to go there and sit and nothing's gonna there's gonna be you know there's nothing up to date about it and so on so we're catering for a different category of people and they were charging about two or three dollars two or three dollars per person and there were so many thousand who were going to attend one sister may allah give her jannah may allah give her jannah a sister contacted the organizers and said brothers how many seats do you have they said so many thousand I'd like to purchase all those tickets and then you can give them free to the people who want to come. You know, my hair was standing when I heard that. In Nigeria, precisely in Abuja, subhanallah, that was something amazing. This was some time back, right? And I learned that there are people who want their wealth to be used in a good cause. They want it. It's a sign of acceptance. When Allah takes away your money for a good reason Allah loves you some people don't volunteer so we do it for them by force by the way we tell them five pound guys so at least at least you can thank Allah oh wow they took it they took it but it's a good cause it's not a bad cause it should be an honor for us it should be an honor wallahi because things are not free personally alhamdulillah I must clear something I don't charge a penny by the will of Allah I can also tell you something about this venue. They haven't charged a penny. Alhamdulillah. So we're fortunate. That's why it's just a fiver. They asked me before they did it. And they, they have their reasons. They have their, you know, their costs and so on. Things are not free. People have come. People have done things. You can see, right? And from the people who are here, a lot, a lot may have been complimentary tickets for whatever reason. I would like to think that if we did have a few guys who actually got up and said, you know, I, I want to give you an another a beautiful encouragement. Recently, I was in Nigeria again. This is a country that people think, oh, these guys, you know, you've got to watch out. And so, wallahi, one of the best places I've been to, Nigeria. The northern part of Nigeria, absolutely amazing, awesome people whom I have found to be so religious and so good. And really, if you speak Arabic, the chances of them speaking back to you in Arabic are almost 90%. And I was sitting and explaining something about a project. And wallahi, wallahi, a brother comes to me 
And this project was like huge, meaning a huge thing. He told me, Inshallah, I'll sponsor that whole project. And I was like, what? Subhanallah. I want to give you another example. There was a television station, a Muslim television station about to close down and they needed so many million. And they made an announcement. Some of you might know the station. They made an announcement to say, look, it's our last um, uh, broadcast because we don't have money. We have to pay X amount. We have so much, so much. One brother phoned in from Nigeria. He says, brother, I write you a check. What amount do you need? X amount. The brother says the next day he flew over. He was just an ordinary man walking with his slippers, with his hat. He came and gave them the whole amount, so many million. And he told him, Salaam Alaikum, anonymous, I'm out. But now, if I were to pay five pounds, 10 pounds, 20 pounds, you know, someone was asking me, oh, but 20 pounds, you know, that, that book, you know, it's, it's for a charitable cause. That's what it is. We should have said, guys, 30 pounds to pay for attendance and the book is included. Some people do that. But no, five pounds. What's five pounds? It's not much. To be honest with you, a lot of us spend that on the same dessert we were talking about moments ago. Subhanallah, five pound is not... We spend it on anything and everything. But when it comes to religion, we need to be reminded, Allah took it from you. Even if you didn't like it initially, change that intention and say, I love it. Next time I pay 10, inshallah. What did it go for? What did you gain? You gained more than five pounds. Do you agree? And so, yes, we could have had the function at a masjid, but trust me, it wouldn't have appealed to the same crowd of people. Perhaps it would have overlapped. Yes, it would have, but not everyone. Another thing is we wouldn't be able to sit and laugh the way we do because a masjid has its own sanctity. There are so many other. We wouldn't have Iman channel, for example, record and say we're going to have it live or we're going to have it replayed on Iman channel or on YouTube and on everywhere else. It may not have been. So there are so many costs involved, Habibi. For me, while some people consider it an honor to spend five pounds, others would actually look at it as a punishment. They wouldn't be ready to spend it. No, I'm not going. Why? They're charging five pounds, man. Subhanallah. And remember, it's not about the speaker. Like I said, with me, I haven't ever charged. No way. In fact, if anything, I wouldn't mind. I honestly wouldn't mind. And I have spent my own resources in a lot of cases to do the work of the deen. But not every speaker can do that. And not every venue can provide it free. I would think a venue of this nature, if we were to pay, I don't even know, thumb suck, probably 10 grand. I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking aloud, maybe more, maybe a little bit less. I don't know, but who paid it? Someone just gave it. We make dua for them. Why not? If they didn't, we would have still had it here. We would have paid for it. And then it would have been 10 quid. You see? So the other five, someone paid it for me and you. Subhanallah, I'm very lucky. But please look at it from this angle that Allah has taken your money for a good cause. So I was speaking to someone about the same thing. That's why I was pointing to a friend of mine because we were discussing this matter. It is a matter. I think for Blackburn, it's something new, right? It may be something new. Well, get used to it. The next time there is an Islamic event, come out and volunteer to give money, to donate. Let's have someone similar to the sister in Nigeria. How many seats do you have? 2,000. What's it? Five quid? 10,000? I'm going to deposit. Just let everyone come in free. Wow. In that case, we would say, just give us 15. We can give the guys uh, five pounds as they're walking out. Subhanallah. For having attended, mashallah. Maybe we can have some free drinks and all that. But to be very honest, my, alhamdulillah, we, we do have costs and I think the bulk of the people really don't mind. You know, if you look at the attendance here, it's to the capacity. Did you see the people putting in more chairs here? Subhanallah. May Allah accept it from all of us. So I thank Allah whenever my money is used in the right direction because that same five quid could have been used for something wrong and it could have been used for a waste. But Allah says, no, I'm going to take it from you through something. And that's why when I was standing in the front, I thanked you to have attended. Didn't I say that? I thank everyone because why? If you don't thank the people, you can't thank Allah. So I thank everyone and I really do. I appreciate it because this is how things will operate and it will go. And I'm enjoying myself simply because we're remembering Allah and we're earning the mercy of Allah and the angels are making dua for us right now because what we're talking about is the remembrance of Allah. This setup may not be absolutely ideal. But it's brilliant because none of us are living in an ideal environment. A lot of the times I've had 
programs where people say, but you know, the sisters say we couldn't see the speaker, we couldn't concentrate, we couldn't see even if it's on a screen. Sometimes, you know what, we have to be realistic. It may not be ideal. We may get there one day. But, subhanAllah, if you notice, the, the people that we aim for are people like you and I who are struggling to get closer to Allah. Someone said, but you know, the pious won't come. I said, I don't want to preach to the preached. I want people like you and I who are going through real life issues. They'll come to us and they'll hear a thing and we will hear from them and we'll inspire each other to become better people. I don't want someone who's going to look at me from the top as though they, they, they're preaching down my throat. No way. I want someone to talk to me. That's why we're having a sofa talk. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair mufti. And yeah, I really relate with that, you know, because um, even me, I went from being in an environment where I, I know people that spend hundreds of pounds on designer clothes and etc. to knowing, alhamdulillah, brothers that will call up on a show, on a fundraising show, and they will, okay, one orphan. 15 minutes later, the same guy, another orphan. And I'm thinking, wow, like that's a lot of money to pay per month. But I think those people that do things like that have really understood that sadaqah does not decrease you in wealth. And I think they've seen that and experienced that and they believe that. And that may be a motivation that also keeps them going to keep donating. Moving on. Yeah, can I say one more? Yeah. You know, when we pay towards a good cause, even if it's a ticket to an Islamic event, don't ever think that that is a fine or it is like someone snatching your money away. If your intention, going back to the previous question you'd asked, if your intention is, inshallah, I'm going to give it to make it easy for them to hold more events of this nature, then inshallah you've contributed to a sadaqa jariyah because you've started a trend that will catch like wildfire by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So look at it as an honor. You know, I have uh, so many examples I could give, but I think let's move on to, uh, let's move on to, the to something else inshallah. So, I mean, we see a lot of young faces here, alhamdulillah. And I <laughs> think Mufti knows where I'm going here. Um, don't worry, I'm not, I'm not going to ask any controversial questions, inshallah. But look, let's just, uh, marriage, you know, a lot, a, a lot of young people want to get married. We get messages about it on a daily basis. People want to get married. Sisters want to get married. They go through struggles trying to get married. Brothers go through struggles trying to get married. And I mean, we don't need to explain as to why they're going through this. I mean, we all live in the society and we all know what's going on. But one question, and I feel like it's a really important question to ask, is before a young person, and this is like to the 17, 18, 19, 20, or even above year olds out there who, who, who seem to want to give their heart to another human being, and they want to fall in love with another human being, but they haven't fallen in love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yet, and they, don't, they haven't truly found themselves yet. What advice, key advice could you give to people like that? Should they get married without finding themselves? What kind of problems can they find themselves in? You know, the difficulty we face now is you have 15 years, 15 year olds and 16 year olds who tell you, I need my nikah done. I need my nikah done. And you say, but why? Because I don't want to commit haram. Come on, come on. You don't want to commit haram. So now you want to get your nikah done. So be strong, be patient, you know, stay away from sin because like you say now, people need to find themselves and by finding themselves, they will definitely find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I always say, you will not even know that your choice of a spouse shapes your future until you get married in a lot of cases. Your choice of a spouse actually determines a lot of your future. So choose well. And if you don't know how to, don't choose with your Hormones. I promise you. That's what people do. They just choose with their hormones. It's a fact. It might have sounded a bit, you know, direct. But it's a fact. People choose with their emotions sometimes. But wait. Go back to the hadith. Go back to the Prophet, peace be upon him. And I've always said the two most powerful organs, the heart and the mind, don't ever give anyone the control of those two because they will hurt you. They will hurt you. You give that to Allah and you give it to anyone after that within what Allah has ordained. But I, we've seen thousands of people get abused and used because they've given their heart and their mind 
in someone else's hand. That's it. They've given it away. Give it in the hands of Allah, your heart and mind and whoever else you're going to love. You can love them more than anything. But if Allah has allowed it and it's ordained. And for this reason, we say, be very careful. My beloved brothers, my sisters, my children, sons and daughters. You know, we sometimes are not even the people whom we should be. For those whom we would like to marry, let me word it again in a different way. We are not whom the person who we want to marry would even want to marry. Do you understand that? The qualities I have, do you really think the guy I want to marry is looking for those qualities? No way. Or the girl who I want to marry? Is looking for those qualities. So I haven't even built my qualities to the point where the person I would like to marry would even be interested in. Would even be, if you get what I'm saying. And, and I want to get married. And that's it. And that's it. There, there goes. So learn to develop yourself. Learn to get closer to Allah. Look at people. Look at others who are married. Talk to them. See what it's all about. And this is why I say my brothers and sisters, do you know when you go to school? And you're growing, you're still finding yourself. You're still setting your foot on the ground. Sometimes we make big mistakes. As we're growing up, Allah will forgive you. But the people who know about it will not forgive you. Allah will forgive you for the mistakes you've made. But unfortunately, the people, even your best friends, will be the biggest sellouts. Because they are not ghafoor rahim Allah is. Man, and this is why you, we're not allowed to spy in Islam. Do you know one of the reasons? If you were to spy on each one of us, we would lose hope in humanity. We are sinful human beings. You spy on me, you may find things that I might be embarrassed. Okay, everyone's on a different level. Some are really major and some are not so major, but it's still embarrassing. If we were to spy on each other and we were to announce it all over the world, we would lose respect for everybody everybody but allah says you know what we're going to keep that's why we say to allah ya man dhahar al jamila wa satar al qabih o you who has made apparent that which is nice beautiful and you've covered that which is evil and embarrassing you've covered it it's it's part of the qualities of allah he's merciful that's his mercy he covered your sin he covered mine because he wants humanity to have faith in humanity once again but the reality is when we spy on someone and we find something out, they may have already sought forgiveness of Allah and come out of it. And we will still be just finding that thing out and start exposing it in a way that we don't realize the guy who's here is the best possible person at this particular point in his life. But I'm taking him back to something that happened in the past because I just found it out now. I give you one example. There was a guy who came to me and told me, you know, I thank Allah. I've had six affairs. This is a true story, right? And I've got the best wife ever, ever, ever. And unfortunately, shaitan came to me and made me have six different affairs. And I thank Allah that my wife didn't find out. And I repent to Allah and I ask Allah's forgiveness. And you know, today I am a person who'd never, ever do that. And I said, brother, why are you telling it to me? Because if that's the case, he might have told it to others as well. And if you're going to tell it to others, your wife's going to get to know. And even if your wife gets to know six years later, I don't think she's Ghafoorul Rahim. <laughs> Subhanallah. That's Allah. She's going to hold it against you and say, I'm out of here. And by the way, that's the wrong advice. To say I'm out of here, people say, Look, just get out. No, don't. Work on it. Help them. You didn't marry in order to just destroy when you find out one or two things. No, you have to help. Yes, when it becomes unbearable, there is a way out. Definitely. But up to that point, you help each other. Come on, you know. But I asked the brothers, why are you telling me? You know what he told me? He says, I'm only ever telling you so that you can relate it to the people. That's what I'm doing here. You can tell people that sometimes a person has done evil without you knowing. They've come out of it. They've sought the forgiveness of Allah. They mended their ways. You didn't ever know and you won't know. Subhanallah. 
But they did worse than what you can ever imagine. But they're gone. It's out of it. Meaning they're out of it. So learn not to look at the past in a way that makes you determine a person's present. You know, you might hear like, it happens a lot these days. Sometimes you want to marry someone and you end up asking a person, you know, I, I'd like to get married. What do you think of this person? And they tell you something that person did in grade five when they were at school and something they did in form one and say, nah, I wouldn't, I really, I'd be careful. You know what? I'd advise you otherwise. That was such a long time back. Look at what happened to their lives thereafter. Okay, it depends the magnitude of the issue. You've got to look into it. But you need to be careful what you say about people. Is it really what they are today? Is it really something that happened recently? Is it something that you really think they're involved in right now? If that's the case, you have to be honest to say, you know what, I know one or two things and so on. But otherwise, what we should be learning, every one of us, if we were to be exposed, even the people we are married to now would probably leave a lot of us. They'd leave us. Sorry guys, don't nod your heads, please, because that's quite bad. But it's a fact, it's a fact. This, this is what happens. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all and may Allah open our doors and grant us goodness. Marriage is a topic that everyone wants to talk about. The only thing I do know about Blackburn and marriage is when, you, when it does happen, this is a good venue to hire, inshallah. <laughs> I like the plug there, mashallah. So, uh, going from the topic of marriage as well now, there's a thing that we commonly see, and it, it relates to a lot of the things that you talk about, Mufti, where let's say there's a brother, he, he's struggling to practice Islam, he's struggling to outwardly look like a Muslim, and inwardly as well, and there's a sister, she's struggling with the same thing, She's inwardly, you know, working on herself and outwardly she doesn't look like a Muslim as well. How important is it that both of those things are in check? Your outward appearance and your inward appearance. And which is more important? They are both equally important. To be honest with you, whatever Allah has made easy for you to start with, you start with it. You work on it. I tell you why. Inward and outward, you pay a price for it not being in order. That price is either uh, digestible by some or not. Say for example, um, and I've known this in a lot of cases, I'm going to give you the example even though it may offend some. Say for example, uh, let me word it in, in, in a nice way, right? Say there's a brother who's not really practicing. He's not practicing outwardly, inwardly, he's quite, and he chooses to get married, for example. And he makes a choice of someone who's similar to him. I tell you what, as time passes, you draw closer to Allah. But the problem is both of you may not draw closer to Allah at the same pace. So you start having a conflict because one is drawing closer to Allah, you know, quicker than the other. So now there's a problem because I'm paying a price of who I was. Not because Allah didn't forgive me or Allah doesn't love me. But it's one of those things. I had a brother who had a huge tattoo and he says, I regret it, but it's permanent and I cannot remove this. What should I do? I said, brother, Allah will forgive you. Allah probably has already forgiven you, but the price you're going to have to pay for what you did is that physically it's going to be there. And Muslims, unfortunately, will look at you and say, haram, astaghfirullah, haram, brother, what you're doing and so on. So it was a mistake he made in his own jahiliyyah, in his own ignorance, but he came closer to Allah. He's going to have to pay a certain price for it if you chopped your hand off because it was the trend to only have one hand you know human beings are quite silly that trend might come one day uh, so everyone's moving around with one hand you know in cape town there was a time when there was a trend that you don't have your front teeth so they actually used to go and surgically remove them so if you see a certain age group of people now they're about 60 65 and the people from cape town who may be here or who may watch this are going to laugh at it because they know what i'm talking about when they smile at you the front four teeth are missing that was a trend. You were like gangster. You know, that's what it was. <laughs> you know, they don't have those teeth. Subhanallah. But later when you understand it's too late, what are you going to do? You're going you're gonna to need dentures which are very, very uncomfortable or something else that's expensive. And to remove it was so easy. So sometimes we do things, we pay a price. We pay a price for that. And this is why I say, as you grow older, try to control yourself. Try to have a good reputation. 
when you sin, sin in private. That's, that's a sign that you are still conscious of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ says, people will still remain upon goodness for as long as they don't openly and proudly commit to sin. Remember that hadith. When your friends know about your sin, I promise you, it's a sign according to the hadith of the Prophet Sallam that your consciousness of Allah needs attention. Right? But when you sin in private and you're too embarrassed even for your best friends to know it, it's a sign that you're, you, are, you still consider that thing haram and taboo. You see? Why I say this is, like I said, if your friends know what you did and your, your buddies all know, one day you have a little fallout that happens to everyone and the next thing it's announced on GBC, whatever that is. But on a big broad broadcasting cooperation, it's just announced. Why? Because there you are. You announced it. People knew about it. So therefore, if you have a weakness, if you've committed a sin, the hadith says do it in private. Well, the hadith doesn't encourage you to commit sin, but how it's worded is, it's the Prophet ﷺ says that people, there is still hope for the people for as long as they don't commit sin openly and proudly. Openly, you're committing the sin. If that's the case, how do you expect the mercy of Allah? So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on all of us. And you know what? Sometimes we, the price we pay for things we've done in the past is there. I think a lot of us would relate to this. It's not like it's going to go away forever, but it's sometimes it's the mercy of Allah. Maybe Allah is protecting you from something. Perhaps Allah knows something that you don't know. Always believe that in the broader picture, whatever's going on is better for you. In the long run, whatever, neg whatever seems negative today is actually better for you. May Allah make it easy for us. Ameen, Ameen. Jazakallah khairan, Sheikh. So, um, Mufti, another thing that came into my head while you were talking about um, this issue of public sinning and private sinning, I've noticed one thing that when people publicly sin, um, not only does it affect them in a very bad way, but it also affects other people. You know, like I was speaking to one brother, and this is a practicing brother. In fact, he's a brother that gives dawah, and many of you may even know him. And he mentioned how just going on Instagram and watching someone's video, and there's this song going around, and someone posted it. And now because of that person's public sin, he goes, I can't get it out of my head. It's just stuck in my head. And it's a thing where imagine every single person, every single person that comes across this bad thing that you've done in public is affected by it. All of those sins, you know, who are they going to if you don't repent? It reminds me of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, whoever sets a good example will have the reward of all those who follow it. And whoever sets a bad example will have carry the sin of all those who followed it. So when you're talking to people, when you're encouraging people, meaning you must encourage people, and when you do things, let it be such that people learn a good thing from you, not a bad thing. If they've learned a bad thing from you, you don't realize how the sin will be clocking in while you're busy at home because you taught them how to do the bad and they keep, they keep, it keeps on going. One example of the remembrance of Allah is when you receive a WhatsApp message that's filled with nudity, pornography, something dirty, unacceptable. I started doing one thing, delete them. The reason is I started thinking, if I forward this clip, and I'm talking of jokes that sometimes are demeaning of a particular person or a race or something, you know, or sometimes it's something that's not worth sending. It's a bad joke. Sometimes it's a dirty joke. To be honest with you, some people actually forward things not realizing I may be on that list. You know, it happens to people. They just forward it to all their friends because they had a good laugh. And they don't, they don't realize, hey, there are a few people you sent it here who would actually, you know, take offense. But excuse the guys. But you have no excuse. Delete the thing. Don't forward it. Because if you forward something dirty from your phone to another phone, that moment of loss of remembrance of Allah, this is what it does to you. You earn the sin of what you did and you earn the sin for every time that message was forwarded thereafter. So much, so much. Why should that happen? Just delete it. It didn't cost you anything. So what if they didn't have such a laugh at such a dirty thing? Big deal. They can laugh at our little jokes about the guy who's, whose vehicle was parked in front of the tire place. By the way, is he back? Did, did you come back, brother? Well, if you did, we have a prize for you. So, inshallah. 
call on you just now. You can walk up the ramp here, come forth, you know. <laughs> Mashallah. So there are other ways of, you know, letting people perhaps laugh and joke, etc. But may Allah make it easy for us. You know, we're living in, in a world where we do get affected by these things, all of us. Let's speak realistically to each other. Remind each other, inshallah, not to do things like these. And we, we become better as the days pass. We improve ourselves. And I am not excluded in what I am saying myself. I'm the first. I need to start with myself and then everyone else. And in that way, inshallah, we'll increase the love. And we, we definitely will learn to love each other. You know, when we sit like this, in a gathering of this nature, in the masjid or anywhere, ask yourself, what, are, what do you feel towards those whom you have met today? Those whom you have seen, those whom you look at, those who are seated next to you. If there is no love, you have a lot of work to do. You need to feel the love. You need to make sure you put it in your heart. I was flying to Hong Kong a few weeks ago. And you know, they're celebrating 100 years of Nelson Mandela in South Africa. So I was flying on South African Airways. And the pilot makes an announcement. You're not going to believe what announcement. And they made it so many times when we were going, when we were coming back, and even on some of the, the, the shorter flights. He says, ladies and gentlemen, we're celebrating 100 years of Nelson Mandela. Living his legacy, we'd like each passenger to greet and introduce themselves to the passenger seated next to them. Have you ever heard that on an aircraft? The last time I jumped in, somebody just did that, you know. Like they didn't even want to sit next to us. Yeah. But the non-Muslims are telling you this. Islam says it from a long time ago. When you're reading your salah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. What are you doing? You're greeting the people and the angels on this side and that side. Did you ever know that? Did you ever know that? But if we could, we'd say, Assalamu alaikum. No, not you, sorry. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. That's what we would do. So if I were to tell you that, inshallah, before you leave, you know, introduce yourselves to the person sitting next to you, inshallah. We, we can do it right now. Exercise. Shake the hand of the person next to you for as long as they're not of the opposite sex, inshallah. <laughs> Say your name, who you are. Don't ask for a business card. Mashallah. And yeah, you get to know each other. You shake hands, you smile, you greet. Mashallah. Barakallah fiq. May Allah bless you guys. And a lot of the times, a lot of the times people don't do this, you know. You attend a function and you're all alone. I know, I know sisters who've attended our functions in London, who work or study in London all alone. For whatever reason, I'm not there to pry into their personal lives. But when they come into the function, sometimes they say, sometimes they say that in other functions we feel so alone because we come in, we walk out, no one's greeted, no one's shown an interest, just because maybe the color is slightly different, maybe you, they didn't know you, whatever else it may have, maybe they might not have been dressed according to the way you wanted them to be dressed. All of these are part of the test of Allah. How's your heart? How's your heart? Will you still greet? Will you still make them feel important? Will you still smile? Will you still offer help? Even if the person is not exactly how you wanted the person to be. If you have got to that level, Alhamdulillah, you've achieved a lot. And this is why when we had Eid in, in London, we've had it a few times now, right? But the Eid in the park, this was the first time. The last time we had Eid in Excel in London. And wallahi, people wrote us feedback. I received feedback as well of people who work alone. You know, London's a city. There are so many people from all over the world who do, whose families are not there. And they say it's the first time we had eat together as an ummah families. There were places to eat and everyone was together and the stalls and everything happened. We felt together as an ummah. There are so many reverts whom we never reach out to. A lot of people, revert wants to marry your daughter. No way. He's not Pakistani. <laughs> you cannot do that. My brothers and sisters, we need to rise above all of this. We need to come, if we are not going to reach out to these people, who will? Bilal ibn Rabah was from Africa. He was from Habasha. If he came and asked for your daughter, what would you do? But the Prophet ﷺ says, Ya Bilal, I heard your footsteps in Jannah. You ready to give your daughter to someone who's going to take your daughter to paradise? I don't want to think what a lot of us would say. May Allah forgive us. 
That's why the hadith says, you look at the deen, you look at the akhlaq. The rest of the things that have come and cropped up, they're all secondary. By the way, people use them as excuses to abuse their children. And by the way, children don't belong to you, they belong to Allah. Allah's just given them to you for a period of time as a token to feel good by calling them my child. But they actually belong to Allah. Evidence of it is inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We belong to Allah and we are all going to return to Allah. We belong to Allah. Your child can go just like Allah gave you the child. May Allah bless those who don't have children with children. Say Ameen. We don't realize it. There are a lot of people who don't have kids. They want to have kids, but they don't. When Allah gives them the child, it's not your ownership. It's very temporary. It's the ownership of Allah. On earth, you have a duty to fulfill regarding those kids. And the duty shall be as per the instruction of Allah, not as per your whims and fancies. So mashallah, that was a beautiful topic. I seized the opportunity to, to speak much, you know, on a much wider scale about the same thing but may Allah bless us all and grant us that love and that goodness and that beautiful feeling and may Allah restore the, 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 the beauty of this this ummah one more thing I can add Sheikh, if you don't mind you know I Allah has granted me the opportunity like some of you as well to travel to a lot of places and interact with Muslims there is a very, very dangerous trend that we need to address. If you ask me what I've noticed as I travel, do you know what I've noticed? Hatred amongst the pious externally within the Muslim Ummah. Did you hear what I said? And I have to say it loud and clear. When we become more pious externally and we are obeying Allah externally through physical means, our hearts are becoming dirtier, dirtier at times. I've noticed hate. They don't even want to talk to others. And this is happening not just with them, but it's more with those people who I see, mashallah, this person is outwardly pious. And it's extremely important. It's extremely important to be outwardly pious. Like you were saying, what is more important? It's both of them are important. Whatever Allah has given you the opportunity to start with, you start with. But take the hate out of you, man. Come on, we are brothers and sisters. Someone might be struggling. Don't make, don't embarrass them because the, outwardly they may not be according to your system. Talk to them in a way that the next time they are so encouraged and motivated that they were not prejudiced against simply because of what they looked like. Come on. Whether it's color, whether it's whatever they're struggling with, you don't know their lives. Some people have done so well, so well. Mashallah. For me, a person who made an effort to attend a function like this one here, subhanAllah, it's a sign of the love of Allah. It's definitely the sign of the love of Allah. If Allah brought you along here, whatever it was and however you were, it's a sign that Allah loves you. And I tell you, I tell my brothers here and even the sisters who might be attending, uh, or who might have visited masjids, whether it's in Makkah, Medina, or anywhere else. Anyone who's in the masjid is a guest of Allah. Make them feel that way. Anyone who's in the masjid is a guest of Allah. Make them feel that way. Subhanallah. Don't make them feel uncomfortable. I remember a guy in London walked into the masjid and he had his three quarters, you know, like we call them Bermudas, three quarter shorts, right? And there's this old uncle who's never, ever, ever absent. He's always in the first saf. And he looks at this young boy who's got his cap the other way around with his three quarters. He says, Astaghfirullah. shaitan <laughs> You know, that's like Urdu. It means, look, shaitan himself has come here today. And you know what? Subhanallah. What would you tell an uncle like that? You tell me. Who is better and who is worse in that case? I don't even want to say. Because they both needed help. But the one who commented needed more help. The other one was already helping himself. Meaning he was halfway through. He was going to the hospital. I mean, you're at the hospital. You can't say, look, the sick guys are here. You can't say that because the hospital is for those who are not well. At least the guys in the hospital. As for you, what are you doing? Being the doctor, the way you're commenting, if you were anyway. May Allah make it easier.